Right? It's, not, it's not inherently valuable unto itself. And so the second pillar of what we do is we make the marginal cost of application development effectively zero. Importantly, it's applications, not dashboards. This is not read-only insight into some data asset. It's actually about making decisions, making decisions as a blue-collar worker. You know, if you go to any Chrysler factory in North America, you will find Foundry on the, on the factory floor used by every single team leader uh, at, the, at the assembly line to make quality decisions in real time. So having that sort of software that creates a connection between the data scientist and the front line and, and translating that to action. channel everyone. Today we're going to be diving into the applications layer in Foundry. This is a heavily misunderstood layer. Um, this goes way beyond your typical BI Tableau type solution. These apps are equivalent to what we as application developers would build for most line of business applications today. It's extremely powerful allowing you to build alerts and notifications and also take action uh, downstream in your ERP systems. And they use a really powerful um, drag and drop solution, sort of widget based solution to build low to no code applications. But if you're a developer, this is a springboard because it's, you have an integrated security model governing the data end to end, which means you don't have to worry about those things. There are DSLs, domain specific languages in Foundry to help you as an application developer as well. So get ready people, we're going to dive into Foundry applications. Foundry puts a lot of flexible tools in the hands of self-service users. It's hard to beat Contour for quick drill down and chart building. And Code Workbooks lets your data scientists run wild on top of your data pipelines. But what about users who need more Rails? In our last video, we saw how moving our data into the ontology unlocked Object Explorer for walk-up data exploration. But how do we go further and build custom applications and rich object views that let our users carry out their daily tasks on top of Foundry? Welcome to the Decision Suite. Let's get started. The Decision Suite on Foundry provides tools to separate the cohesive end user experience, like this aviation analyst workspace, from the developer components that make it up. We've already seen a few of these components. In our last video, we explored the object layer, where our object types and relations formed the bedrock data component that we'll use to back our applications. And we checked out the object view as a container component, where we can place rich experiences within the context of a single object. We'll spend the next few minutes of this video inside a tool called Workshop which for these purposes, I consider the starting point for building the interface components themselves. Those interfaces can be standalone apps like our inbox application or placed inside an object view like those we saw in the last video. There are lots of reference workshop implementations in both these categories to explore across the reference project. You can find the standalone inbox app in two levels of complexity as well as the map-centric command center. Also, all the different object types have one or more example workshop interfaces within their object views, which you can get to through the object view editor when looking at any one specific object. All right. so. The first big takeaway when I saw this, um, for me anyway, was that, you know, Palantir eats its own dog food. It's building Foundry and it's building the deliverables for their customers like Skywise out of this low to no code application layer, which should tell you point number two, which is we've gone way beyond BI tools here. You know, like we're ac they're actually building real world responsive apps with modern user experience that does stuff, does real, delivers real, wait for it, wait for it, business value, right? So like. Again, Foundry is this complete ecosystem that includes the applications layer to build business value on top of. Now, there are a lot of um, tools that we're not going to get to see in this video, but there, I want you to know there, there are domain-specific languages for doing things like building filters and queries. 
that they've built into their application tool. And there's also a full developer suite. So if you want to go straight to TypeScript and you don't want, you know, and react the React layer, you can do that. You don't have to be stuck in the GUI where a lot of operators will be. But I also believe like in that intro screen you saw, when you get into more of the deep tools, that there will be a certification purpose built for the application operator and programmer that is a low to no code um, application certificate. So don't stress if you're not an application developer. You don't need to know, you know, React and TypeScript and JavaScript and HTML and CSS and all that crap to be productive in here. So um, let's take a quick look at some of those low to no code tools. Project from scratch over there. So hang tight for the fastest intro app build out I can do, replicating our simple alert inbox. We've got primary concepts in Workshop. Our layout, built with pages, sections, and drawers, will define the structure of our app. Into our layout, we'll add widgets that display data and provide user interaction elements. And we bring in our data and wire together our widgets for interactivity with variables. Let's start with the main visual component of the app, which is the table of alerts. We drop in an object table widget, and now we need to feed it some data. It asks us for an object set variable to display, so we'll quickly define a new variable to hold all of the alerts, which we can see immediately populate our table. We need to set the properties to display as columns, and we can see that our display and conditional formatting, which we defined in the ontology management app, is reflected in the display in the table, and a bit of dragging around the column order and width to tidy up our layout. We've also got two new variables that were automatically created by the table that reflect the active object, always highlighted in blue, and optionally, the set of selected objects if we flip on the multi-select config. I like to give these a quick rename to make it more clear what they represent. We can use these variables to show additional details based on what our user does in the table. So here's our first layout change. Let's add in a new drawer to get an overlay and tweak it to be wider and remove the header. And into that drawer, we put our second widget, an object view that we point to the active object from our table. This is our first glimpse at the reusability we get from our object view containers. Build it once and use it everywhere. We can close the drawer by clicking away, but we need a way to reopen it. We'll come back to more sophisticated patterns for this in a future video, but for now, we'll do the simplest thing and open the drawer whenever the user clicks a different row in our table by adding an event in the table widget config. And we want our users to be able to filter the table contents. So let's make our left sidebar collapsible and drop in a filter list widget and wire it up. We want to filter starting from all of our alerts and then let the user filter on the status, category, and risk score properties. We'll also let the user add their own filters so they can tailor it to their needs. Our filter list kicks out a new variable type. Instead of an object set variable, we've got a filter variable and can see in the contents that we have a serialization of the filter state. Like our table state variables, let's rename this to something more memorable. To use this filter, we need to apply it to an object set variable like this. We create a new object set variable that starts from our existing set of all alerts, and then we apply our filter variable. Now we can replace the object variable that flows into our table with the one we just created. And just like that, our filter now controls what's displayed. We've got a tidy little workflow, filter, select, review. Let's quickly hit a few polish details. Next to our alert details object view, let's add in the details of the route as well. We want a tab layout here, so we copy and paste our object view so we have two of them. Remove the current object view from the layout, change the container layout to tabs to get it to full size, then plop our object view back into tab one, and in tab two, place our copy. Now we replace the object view source variable with a new object set variable that starts from the active alert and does a search around to bring back the related route. Our variable now represents the linked route and we can see the object view update with all the context about the route and its overall performance. Again, reusing the views and interfaces we've already built. 
With our details fleshed out, let's return to add some polish to our main table. We want our users to have a bit of context about the overall set of alerts they're working with. Small widgets in the section header are a great way to present this information. Let's drop an object set title widget into the header and point it to our filtered alerts variable. This will automatically show the count of objects in the set and can make a nice section title. Next to it, Let's add the average risk score for the visible alerts. A metric card in tag mode fits nicely in a section header, and we can do the aggregation calculation in a new numeric type variable, choosing the object set aggregation option and then averaging the risk score property from the filtered alerts object set variable. We want to limit the displayed precision with the numeric formatting config, and we'll add a condition to get a subtle warning tint if the average is above 5. And finally, let's wire up a direct action so we can make bulk changes in alert assignee rather than only going through the object view. In our table header, we drop in a button group, which is the starting point for anything that requires a user click, like links or workshop events, or in this case, write back actions. We want to choose the bulk assign route alert action, and in the defaults, we pass in the selection object set variable from our table widget. Now we can select, click our button, and choose an assignee for all these alerts. Okay, I think that's enough workshop intro to be dangerous. We've seen how to pull in data from our object layer and display it in a filterable table, how to drive interaction from that table to show details with our reusable object views, and how to wire in an action, again, reusing an existing logic component. You'll find tons more example app patterns scattered around the reference project. Charts and maps, derived metrics, and interactions with TypeScript functions where you can write code for further customization. Explore these, as well as the Foundry Academy 400 series, for a full introduction to the Decision Suite. And we'll be back with more videos in the future, exploring specific patterns in the app building world, including using Workshop to build out interfaces in our object view containers, and patterns for building apps that don't rely on existing data pipelines. All right. so. The first thing to recognize here is this button that he's pointing to, bulk assign. They have these buttons that actually do stuff. Again, we want to, we want to focus in on this. And um, this is really neat that they have a concept of like actions you can take in Foundry, uh, alerting being one of them. Um, they also have write back into ERP systems and several other features. If you watch the Hyper Auto demo too, you'll also see where they use this alerting system in that demo as well. Uh, but I found this really, really cool that they actually have a concept of actions that you can take. What also was interesting in there was that, um, I think Logan is his name, was explaining that in the very end of that, you can build apps on things that don't rely on data pipelines in Foundry. And I was like, oh my God, okay. So they're, they're not limiting themselves to applications that just rely on their data pipelines. You can actually build this on top of other things. Maybe that's other APIs you want to consume or you know, any kind of vanilla app you could think of that you could build in React or TypeScript, which I thought was really, really cool. The thing to point out here quickly is that um, there's also a domain specific language in here for filters. And I assume that there's a DSL for um, a lot of other application features, meaning there's this like, it looks like a JSON structure here uh, that defines how the filter works. And that's really helpful for application developers who want to use this tool because they can go straight to the DSL and just start programming in there. And that's super helpful. And also, Logan mentioned there's TypeScript functions available. So if you want to go deeper as an application developer and be able to sort of do, um, you know, like power user stuff you might have done in Excel with macros or something, they have TypeScript available for that. And anyone who's used TypeScript, you know, having type safety in the language and how easy that language is to use, you're going to find that really, really powerful. So there is this ability to go straight to code within the UI, uh, but also I believe there's the ability to just build applications directly using the equivalent of an SDK. 
Um, but this is really cool that you have this power to go in and just edit filters manually, which is something that most people are going to find really, really useful. And also don't be afraid if you know, you're not picking all this stuff up right away. Like you obviously need a certification in this tool. Like I know most of you are probably going, what the fuck was that when you first watched it, right? Like you're just like, oh my God, what happened there? Um, don't worry. Uh, they have, I'm sure they have a certification program. It's going to take training. This is not something you just pick up like immediately and start using it. Maybe, maybe you can if you're used to these type of tools or you're a developer or something, but don't worry if you're not following along with all these concepts. There will be training. All right, so... What does it mean? What is all? What's the big takeaway here? The big takeaway is that Palantir has managed to do what kind of no other company has managed to do. The ability to make your operators into engineers is going to be highly disruptive. And if you're an application developer, you need to start preparing yourself for this future of low to no code applications. I've been saying for a long time this is the future. You can see the writing on the wall with platforms like Versal and now Foundry that you as a developer will have to develop new skills, including Foundry certification, to make yourself relevant. And Alex Karp has said this in interviews, like to be relevant in the future, people need Foundry certification. And I truly believe that. I actually think that, you know, this is going to be the application platform of the future. So if you're a developer out there or you're someone who wants to get certified on Foundry, be patient, you'll get the opportunity. But this is a game changer. But with that, I'm going to uh, leave you with Sankar, who pretty much summed up what this means in the very beginning of this video. It's not, it's not inherently valuable unto itself. And so the second pillar of what we do is we make the marginal cost of application development effectively zero. Importantly, it's applications, not dashboards. This is not read-only insight into some data asset. It's actually about making decisions making decisions as a blue collar worker. You know, if you go to any Chrysler factory in North America, you will find Foundry on the, on the factory floor used by every single team leader uh, at, the, at the assembly line to make quality decisions in real time. So having that sort of software that creates a connection between the data scientist and the front line and, and translating that to action.